Welcome to this video on the top 10 werewolves of the Red Talons tribe. The Red Talons are a unique tribe in the Garu Nation for one reason. There is no such thing as a Hamid Red Talon. They do not breed with humans, at all, for any reason. They have no human kinfolk anywhere in the world. Now the word supremacist is a bit played out, but it applies to the Red Talons perfectly. They are unapologetic wolf supremacists. Their opinion of humanity varies from a desire to exterminate the human race entirely, or to reduce humanity back to prehistoric levels and restore the ancient domination of the Garu Impergium, to a more moderate position, according to them, of killing humans down to an acceptable and controllable number. The Red Talons even aim their scorn at fellow Garu who dwell too close to cities or who possess too many Hamids among them, calling them Ura, tainted ones. But without further ado, the top 10 werewolves of the Red Talons. Number 10, Stains Glass. The Garu have a strained relationship with most human religions. Most Garu avoid them entirely. Some have tried, unsuccessfully, to wage war against them, a few have managed to subvert human religions from within, but a rare red talon ragabash known to lore as Stains Glass actually managed to use the Christian church as a weapon against itself for the good of her sept. Stains Glass was a member of a sept of calm located in a deep forest owned by a noble who forbade his peasants from entering the place. There were rumors in the sept that the band was put in place because the noble family was kinfolk to some tribe, either the children of Gaia or the warders of men. But as Stain's Glass was a red talon, this did not concern her. The humans stayed away, and all was well. Then, one winter, the last nobleman of the family died. With no son to inherit his title and lands, he donated all he possessed to the church thereby securing a place for himself in heaven. The church quickly sent some of its shepherds to attend to the wayward flock by building a small chapel and then connecting it to the trade road with other villages. The ambitious priest even began cutting a road through the deep woods to increase the trade and tithes that would pass through their small village. The elders of the sept were enraged by this and talked of killing all the humans in the vicinity. But Stain's Glass did not approve of this. Up until this point, the humans had not done them any harm. And if she was clever, only a little blood would need to be spilled to restore the status quo. Shifting into Hamid form, Stain's Glass snuck into the village and stole a piece of cloth hanging from outside of someone's home. Then she pierced her palms with a sharp piece of wood. Afterwards, she raised the most terrible howl anyone had ever heard screeching that the churchmen had stolen the lands from the nobleman. She pointed at the chapel and screeched that evil dwelt therein. The villagers, drawn by both fear and curiosity, followed her at a distance. The red talons smeared the blood of her palms against the windows of the church, staining them. Then, when the villagers were close enough, she stepped sideways into the umbra, leaving behind only the bloodied sheet as proof of her existence but it was enough. The villagers roused the churchmen and expelled them from their lands. They kept the trade roads open, but the road into the deep forest was never finished. In place of the chapel, which the villagers tore down, they erected a small shrine to house the bloody sheet worn by the angel of the forest. Number nine, Blood Moon. Blood Moon exemplifies all of the hatreds of the Red Talons in the body of a single Garu. He hates humans for killing his pack after his first change and departure to become a Red Talon. He hates wolves for their weakness in falling prey to humans, who are not true predators, only prey tainted by the weaver and the worm. He hates the Garu for what he sees as their compromising ways, their inability to do what is necessary for Gaia. But most of all, he hates himself for his own failures, his failure to save his wolf pack from humans, and even his failure to become a true Garu. Blood Moon failed in his rite of passage and has never undergone another. 
Since then, he has surrounded himself with other failures like him, outcasts of any breed or tribe, though he prefers fellow Aruns. Blood Moon leads his ragged pack against any human settlements he can. He does not care whether he strikes at the worm or not. Blood Moon just needs something, anything to lash out at, like a wolf with his foot caught in a trap. Additionally, Blood Moon has a unique quirk, evidence that perhaps he is touched by the wild or Luna in some way. He rarely assumes Hamid form, but each time he does, its appearance is always different. Sometimes he is European, sometimes he is African, sometimes he is Asian, sometimes he is Native American. It is unknown if he has a set number of Hamid forms into which he can shift. Blood Moon himself has no idea why he is so blessed or cursed in this way, only that it has always been so since he first changed. The Red Talon Theurges who are aware of his unusual condition believe it to be an omen of some sort, though they are uncertain as to what it portends. Thus far, Blood Moon's attacks on humans have gone unchallenged, but this may change in the future as the apocalypse nears. Number 8. Storm Eye Storm Eye was born in 1991 to a strong pack of wolves. She had a brother with whom she was inseparable when they were pups. He managed to fight and drive off a bear at just one year old, earning the name Fights the Bear. Later, he would become Alpha of the wolf pack. As for Storm Eye, she later underwent the first change and was taken to the Sky Pine Sept to undergo the rite of passage. From this rite, she gained the name Judge of the Trees. Later, she joined the Summer Sun Pack, tasked with warding the Sept from incursions by humans and worm forces. But in time, one of the Summer Sun's pack fell to the worm. The rest of the pack were slain when they went to deal with the traitor. Judge of the Trees would have joined them that day, but for the interference of the silent strider Galliard, Mephi, faster than death. Mephi later joined her in hunting down and slaying the traitor Galru. It was from this battle that Judge of the Trees got her other name, Storm Eye, Two World Daughter, as the battle was fought during a raging blizzard and the traitor managed to take one of her eyes before finally succumbing to death. Storm Eye succumbed to Harano and limped back to the territory of her birth pack to rejoin her beloved brother, Fights the Bear. Yet her return proved to be the downfall of Fights the Bear. He had reached the end of his years as a wolf and prepared to wander off into the woods to die in quiet solitude, as most wolves do. Yet Storm Eye decided that he should die as a warrior and forced him to go off and attack human hunters. Fights the Bear slew one of the humans before being shot by another. Satisfied that her brother had died honorably, Storm Eye returned to her kinfolk pack so that they might honor him. But the wolves refused to howl for Fights the Bear for he had acted against his own nature by attacking humans. In panic and confusion, Storm's Eye fled to a sept of fellow Red Talons who would surely understand what she had done. Instead, they mocked her to her face. She had forced Fights the Bear's fate on him, so they named her Storm Eye Wiser Than Gaia. Again, she fled, this time from the Red Talons, and in shame. Storm's Eye raced around the world, fighting alongside Black Furies and Shadow Lords in Europe, but her crimes always nipped at her heels. While she was aiding a Get of Fenris Sept under attack by the forces of the Worm, the Jarl ordered her to flee with a young child of Gaia Metis named Cries Havoc and a glass walker named Julia Spencer. While they were making their escape, a bane attacked Storm Eye, a shadowy wolf that filled her heart with pain and terror. The three werewolves, however, managed to reach England and then flew to New York. Storm Eye traveled with the motley pack for a time, which was joined by the Wendigo, John Northwood's son, the stargazer, Antoine Teardrop, and the Bonar, Big Sis. In upstate New York, they were once again confronted by the Shadow Wolfbane, who Storm Eye finally recognized as her dead brother, Fights the Bear, now twisted by death into a creature of the worm. Storm Eye confronted the Shadow Wolf in a battle that was as much against herself as it was against the thing that her brother had become, or rather, what she had made him into. 
but she defeated the bane and conquered her own weakness and came to terms with her own wrongdoings. She continued to lead the pack for a time, but eventually left them to fulfill her duty as a philodox, arbitrating disputes between feuding members of Red Talon Sept. Number 7. Crookpaw. Crookpaw is a ragabash and one of the rare metas permitted to continue living among the Red Talons who gave birth to him. But due to his efforts to overcome the limitations of his birth, his fellow Red Talons regard him as more lupus than those who have been born lupus, even as he limps along on three good paws, hence his name. Crookpaw is a vehement hater of humans and calls loudly and unambiguously for their total extermination. He also regards all Hamidgaru as Ura, tainted ones, who are not to be trusted. Despite his unabashed prejudices, he often travels to Hamid-dominated septs to challenge those monkey lovers who would dare to oppose the Red Talons. Additionally, Crookpaw has amassed one of the largest collections of Red Talons lore within his bitter but razor-sharp mind. What he intends to do with this lore is a secret to all but him. He does not take the Hamid form, ever, and has only lived as a wolf, hunting and feasting on deer and moose. He knows he will never breed, nor be the equal of any healthy lupus, which only deepens his bitterness. But he is respected by his fellow Red Talons because of his perseverance and his fearlessness. What role Griffin intends for this strange wolf in the apocalypse, only time will tell. Number 6. Strongest Sun When the Red Talons managed to enter southern Africa, they found that there were no wolves for them to breed with. These Red Talons were a bit more pragmatic, or desperate, than their brethren elsewhere. One Red Talon looks to the sun, a phylodox, made a bargain with the Makole Mbembe, the were-crocodiles of the region. If the Red Talons would accomplish a task for the crocodiles, they would dream a new form for the Red Talons, thereby giving them the ability to breed with the African wild dog otherwise known as the Cape Hunting Dog, smaller than wolves, but more social. These African Red Talons, the Kuche Kundu, then became the allies of the Mokole for centuries. Looks to the Sun has since perished, but his bloodline, and perhaps his spirit, remained in the form of one of his descendants, Lion Howl. Lion Howl was born to the sound of poachers' guns, but his mother taught him not to hunt the humans. If the poachers believed that there was nothing worth hunting in an area, they would simply ignore the place. If they thought that there was dangerous game to hunt, then they would flock to an area. During his youth, Lion Howl looked at how his mother helped to hide animals from the hunters, and sure enough, the hunters went elsewhere. But several months after his first change, the hunters returned. This time, the humans did not want elephant or lion skins, for these had eluded them in the bond of the cairn of the bloodied rock. But they did hear of crocodiles in the river near the sept. Lion Howl, named for his unusual and rough manner of howling, went to the Makole Mbembe. The were crocodiles were the warriors of their kind, and had little patience for humans, but even less for those who presumed to hunt them. Lion Howl sat patiently by the bank of the river until the Mokole decided to speak with him. Lion Howl asked that the Mokole leave the humans in peace and hide themselves until the hunters passed. The Mokole replied that if they killed the humans now, then they would never return. But Lion Howl said that killing the humans would only bring more of their kind until the Mokole were overwhelmed. The Mokole grumbled that the humans deserved to die but the pup only answered that they would, someday, but that day need not be today. Finally, Lion Howl reminded them of the ancient agreement between them, the Kuche Kunda and the Pharaoh of Africa, to protect them in exchange for giving them the Cape Dog form. The Makole growled at this but had no response, so he went and told his brethren to submerge themselves in the river and not rise until the poachers had gone. The hunters grew frustrated with the lack of game and drifted along their boats down the river. When Lion Howl returned to speak to the Makole, he thanked them for honoring the treaty, 
But the Macaulay cut him off. No, pup, I thank you, the strongest child of looks to the sun, for reminding me of the lessons he brought, that the mistakes of the past need not cost us the future. From that day forward, Lion Howl was known to the African Pharaoh and the Kuche Kundu as strongest son. Today, he leads the sept at the Cairn of the Bloodied Rock. The Cairn is open to all Pharaoh and Gauru from other lands, so long as they are untainted by the worm. As a galliard, he enjoys sharing and hearing stories from faraway places and unusual visitors. Number 5. Akosha's Eye One of the tribal rites of the Red Talons is the Rite of Prophecy. It is well known within the tribe, but rarely used more than once by any but Theurges, because prophecy is as treacherous as trying to catch droplets of water in the pads of a wolf's paws. But in 1999, the Red Talons who used the Rite of Prophecy saw strange visions of dragons battling demons, who had been awakened from their slumber by the shrieking of cranes. Now for those versed in the lore of Vampire the Masquerade and Kindred of the East, they will recognize the symbolism of these creatures and what they represent. The cranes are a reference to the Quasian who began the war in India against the Ravnos of the subcontinent. The demons are a reference to the malicious creatures of the spirit world and the chymistry spawn monsters of the Ravnos antediluvian also known by the sobriquet, the King of Demons. The dragons are a bit tricky, as they could either be a reference to the three Quasian Bodhisattvas who would meet Zapathashur in battle in Bangladesh and die trying to destroy him, or it could be a reference to the Technomages of the Technocracy, whose Asian branch is also known as the Five Metal Dragons. Regardless, one Red Talon Theurge, newly raised to the third rank, Audrin, recognized a deeper meaning behind the visions, the storm that would soon consume Bangladesh within the human population, an outcome pleasing to most of the Red Talons, but the power of the ancient worm spawn and the other monsters of Asia would wreak havoc on the Umbra, something that the Theurge known as Akosha's Eye could not leave unchallenged. She appealed to the leaders of her sept for a war pact to journey to Asia and combat the menace before it grew out of control. They refused, believing that throwing away Gauru lives in a storm of such magnitude would be folly. So Akosha's eye departed alone. However, she met Gauru along the way who were swayed by her visions and traveled with her to Bangladesh. When the Hanga Yokai confronted Akosha's eye in her ad hoc pact, they demanded to know her business in their domain. She answered with three simple words, service to Gaia. The Hanga Yokai were wary of the barbaric Garu, but regarded the quiet Theurge as sincere in her mission, so they allowed her to pass into the maelstrom. Akosha's eye never reached the epicenter of the storm raised by the Quajin and fed by the madness of the bloodthirsty god. This was for the best, as she would have met the same fate as all who perished in the nuclear hellfire the technocracy rained down in their desperation to stop the antediluvian. Still, she and her pack fought for their very lives against the spirits and demons that spread on the winds to feed on pain and suffering elsewhere. By the end of the week of nightmares, even Hange Yokai accepted her leadership due to her tactical acumen and bravery in protecting Gaia, or the Emerald Mother, as the Hange Yokai call her. Akosha's eye succeeded in holding back the worst of the demons, keeping them confined within the storm winds. When her strength was spent and she was covered in battle wounds, Akosha's eye collapsed, thinking her work was done and that her spirit would finally return to Gaia. Yet she felt a presence and a will that filled her with new life. This was not the place she was meant to die, the presence told her. She would die in time, but it would be as a revered teacher of her tribe. Akosha's eye dragged her battered body back to safety among the Hange Yokai. When she was healed, she then returned to her sept. In the final days, Akosha's eye is a leader of her sept and responsible for training young red talons in battle, but not battle to slaughter humans or avenge past grievances, but rather to protect Gaia. It's not a glorious death, 
but it is perhaps a better legacy. Number four, worm baiter. There is perhaps no red talon in the 20th century who is the subject of such controversy as worm baiter, especially among the Garu of Australia. To the red talons, especially those of the Predator King's camp, he is a conqueror, a warrior, and even a hero. To more moderate red talons, and especially Garu outside of the tribe, worm baiter is a fool, a dupe of the worm, a breaker of the litany, and a villainous kinslayer on par with any black spiral dancer. Wormbaiter was born in the early 20th century and was a lupus of massive size and power. In his birth form, he was a great black wolf, nearly the size of a pony. He was born in Europe, though he immigrated, or was exiled depending on who was telling the tale, to Australia. For those who subscribe to the immigration version of Wormbaiter's tale, he had slain worm creatures for miles around his home cairn and traveled to Australia to cleanse that land of its monsters. But for those who say he was exiled by the Silver Fangs, they say he murdered an emissary in a blind rage, or that he was one of the leaders of the Predator Kings, banished from Europe with many of that camp, or that he violated the litany by mating with his own sister, Greyflank. Two things are known without question. Greyflank did accompany him to Australia and helped him seize control of the Red Talons of Australia. The other is that he hated the Bunyip with a deep, visceral loathing. To his mind, they were not Garu at all, but some blasphemous mockery of werewolves. He is often quoted as growling, what is a Garu that does not howl? Now Wormbaiter and his pack demurred from waging war against the Bunyip for fear of reprisal from the other tribes. But when Greyflank was found, headless on the border of the Bunyip lands, with the scent of thalassines around her, Wormbaiter's rage was boundless. He gathered the Garu of Australia in a moot and demanded retribution. To this day, it is a mystery why the Fianna and the Silverfangs acceded to his demand. Perhaps they thought that Wormbaiter would be satisfied with only a few dead Bunyip. Perhaps the other tribes, such as the Shadow Lords and the Ged of Fenris, coveted the Bunyip's cairns enough that they were willing to let Wormbaiter kill to his heart's content. The Children of Gaia, the Glasswalkers, and the Stargazers abstained from the War of Tears and even tried to save the Bunyip, but their efforts were in vain. In a single year, Wormbaiter and his allies hunted the Bunyip and their kinfolk down to the last. Wormbaiter claimed the honor of slaying the last Bunyip himself, who was hiding in a cave on the slopes of Mount Kosciuszko. The Bunyip was quietly singing a song of mourning for his people when Wormbaiter found him. So, the last Bunyip said, you are my death. I shall be glad to die. You have spared none of my kindred, and were I to live, I would be so lonely that death would seem a blessing. You are no Garu, Wormbaiter snarled. The worm's taint marks you. But the last Bunyip, filled with resignation and sadness, replied, The only worm I see is the worm in your eyes, cousin. But enough words now. You would not listen to us when we tried to show you the error of your ways, when we tried to tell you that the black spiral dancers hindered us from attending your moot and mourning your sister. You turned away. I'm weary. All I crave is death. With a single blow of his crinos form, Wormbaiter obliged the last Bunyip, cleaving his head from his neck. As the last Bunyip spirit passed Wormbaiter, it choked off his howl of triumph. There was no malice, no corruption in the dead Bunyip's soul. Only peace, tranquility, and a communion with Gaia that Wormbaiter would never know. For the first time in a year, and perhaps in his life, Wormbaiter saw with eyes clear of rage. Then, the last Bunyip's body shifted into its natural Hamid form that of a 16-year-old aborigine boy. 
Wormbaiter's eyes filled with tears as the enormity of what he had done crashed down on him like a waterfall. Then, a woman's voice, sweet as honeyed poison, hailed him from a shadow in the cave that not even the firelight left by the last bunyip could pierce. What is this now? The mighty Wormbaiter? Crying? This will not do. This will not do at all. She stepped from the darkness, pale as moonlight, hair as dark as the shadows that had seemingly birthed her, holding a blood-soaked hemp bag in the delicate fingers of her left hand. Wormbaiter, you have been magnificent, as I knew you would be. She purred with the voice of the defiler worm itself. You are the greatest tool I have ever used. Wormbaiter was still in Arun and crouched low, ready to attack. But the sinuous Hamid Garu was unshaken by this posturing and introduced herself as Mara the Scream of the Black Spiral Dancers. She claimed to have known Greyflank intimately in her last moments and that she had a present for Wormbaiter. Mara then unceremoniously tossed the contents of her bag at Wormbaiter's feet, the severed, rotted head of Greyflank. Mara thanked Wormbaiter for ridding the Black Spiral Dancers of the Guardians of the Dreamtime, leaving it defenseless for the Dancers. Once the Dreamtime fell, she said, Australia would belong to them. She laughed at Wormbaiter's misplaced rage, for it had been Mara who slew Greyflank and prevented the Bunyip from reaching the moot in time to defend themselves against the Garu's condemnation. Still laughing, Mara the Scream stepped back into the darkness, where Wormbaiter then saw the other Black Spiral Dancers, welcoming her into the heart of one of their newly created hives. The Garu outside of the cave heard Wormbaiter's heart-rending howl of despair and raced into the cave. They found him half-mad, snapping at the empty air. He recounted what Mara the Scream had said to him, how he had been deceived and the Bunyip had been innocent of Greyflank's murder. Howling one last time, Wormbaiter threw himself into a chasm at the rear of the cave and was never seen again. Number 3. Mamu Despite the rumors surrounding Wormbaiter and Greyflank, Wormbaiter bred litters of pups with the Red Talons. Kinfolk, who eventually bred with the dingoes of Australia. His blood eventually reached a large black dingo pup called Mamu, who grew to be the size of a calf by the time he reached adulthood. For the first two years of his life, Mamu was consumed by battle lust. He first fought the members of his litter, not to dominate them, but from simple desire to fight someone. When he reached adolescence, the only dingo that could withstand him was the pack leader, who soon became Mamu's most hated enemy. Month after month, Mamu tried to beat the pack leader and failed each time. When the first change was about to come on Mamu, only the leader sensed that something was wrong in the young dingo and joined with the others in the pack to drive him off. Alone, for the first time in his life, Mamu also felt fear for the first time. He heard strange voices on the wind, and shadows flickering on the ground without shapes to cast them. Little did Mamu understand that he was peering into the umbra as the first change began to overtake him. When the full moon rose, he shrieked in pain and confusion as his body began to change. Mamu raced back to the pack that had exiled him. He was confronted by the enraged Alpha, but by then it was too late. Mamu's rage had taken on a life all its own. It filled his body and changed him. He stood up on his hind legs. His forelegs turned into massive arms and hands with razor-sharp talons on the ends of each finger. By the time he returned to his senses, Mamu no longer had a rival for domination of the pack. The elder Dinga, who had frustrated him so many times before, was torn to pieces by Mamu, and he was the leader now. He led the dingoes for a full year before a pack of red talons discovered him and brought him to their sept to be trained. By sheer ferocity and prowess in battle, Mamu rose to become the alpha of the Pilbara Protectorate 
after defeating three other Red Talon protectorates and merging them into his territory. He was the largest and strongest Red Talon in Australia, and by strength claimed the Red Talon seat on the Jindabin Council. Yet he found himself disgusted by the domination of the council by Hamids and their meaningless monkey words. More than once, Mamu had to restrain himself from tearing out the throats of his fellow council members. As mentioned before, Mamu was a descendant of Wormbaiter through another red talon named Split Mountains, who battled a Bane Lord in Australia, but was abandoned in this battle by the Mokole of the Red Sands, and swore vengeance against the Mokole thereafter. Mamu took up his ancestor's vendetta as his own. When he learned of Peter Ward and his Gumagan Mokole friends, he vowed to destroy them both. But this was not to be. Peter Ward, the only Garu to ever learn the Mokole gift of Nisus, summoned the progenitor wolf from the ancestral memories of the Garu present. The wolf commanded them to stop attacking the pharaoh and declared that Mamu was no true wolf. After this event, Mamu's pack would not follow him, turn their backs on him, and he fled into the outback, once again alone. For a more detailed description of the events between Mamu, Peter Ward, and the Gumagan Makole, see my video on the top 10 werewolves of the Glass Walkers. For a time after his shaming by the progenitor wolf, Mamu wandered the outback in confusion. Later, Rumors hinted that Mamu had defected to the Black Spiral Dancers. But more recent tales say that a massive black dingo has attacked Garu, especially Red Talons, defeated them, and then dragged them away, still alive, to be converted. Five of Australia's 44 Red Talons have disappeared in this manner. The Jindabin Council has demanded that Rage in the Streets, Mamu's successor on the Jindabin Council, appear before them and answer for Mamu's actions, and whether or not the Arun still speaks for the Red Talons of Australia. Number 2. Blood Eye Blood Eye was born in Minnesota in 1957, a cub of a Red Talon leader named Three Paws. Tribe business took Three Paws away from his pack for a full year. On his return, he discovered, much to his surprise, that one of his litter, Blood Eye, had begun manifesting some Garu traits even before undergoing the first change, and was leading the pack. But Blood Eye was still a wolf at this point, and regarded his unknown father as a challenger to his position. It was a fight that Three Paws barely won. Three Paws then took Blood Eye from the wolves to be raised and instructed among the Red Talons. Soon, the first change came upon Blood Eye. By the age of 25, Blood Eye rose to become Alpha of the Red Talons tribe and delights in meeting any challenge to his leadership with Claw and Fang. Blood Eye is also the greatest proponent of the Predator King camp. He has personally led attacks on dozens of human communities in the American Midwest. The only reason that Blood Eye has not led a slaughter of humans in America and Canada is that the other tribes hold him in check. In fact, they have had to dominate him, albeit temporarily, to prevent him from engaging in mass murder against humanity, a fact that has only deepened his hatred of humans and his resentment against the Hamid-led tribes. The only allies he recognizes are the Wendigo, but the only tribe that he trusts is his own. Number 1. Old Wolf of the Woods Once. There was a Red Talon known as Center of Whispers, who heard legends from the eldest Garu about Old Wolf of the Woods, supposedly an immortal wolf who watched over all Garu, who embodied the wild, the hunt, the song of wolves howling to Luna, and the folly of humans. Center of Whispers had been born to wolves with the blood of the Red Talons in him. He was born under a full moon, and as a pup was strong and quick a natural Arun. When a cougar caught him alone in the woods, he was rescued by a great lone wolf with red fur. The wolf slew the cougar, shared the kill with the pup, then nudged Center of Whispers back home. Then the great wolf disappeared back into the woods. 
Center of Whispers grew older and underwent the first change. A red talon called Blood Tongue came and took him away from his litter and his pack, telling him that he was different, a red talon, a skin changer. He learned the Krino's war form and how to wear the man shape. Center of Whispers found it odd. The paws of men curled and flecked strangely. They had no fur, and they couldn't smell as well as wolves could. Other red talons hated humans, but Center of Whispers felt pity for the strange creatures. They were confused, frightened things. He liked to call them mouth sensors, because they tried to communicate everything with their tongues, ignored smell, in favor of what they could see and hear. Center of Whispers decided that he preferred to exist in his lupus form with its sharp nose, sharper fangs, and thick gray pelt. One day, he sat to listen to another red talon called Snow from Skies, who spoke about Old Wolf of the Woods, who had tricked the Gural and led them away from the cairns of the red talons during the War of Rage. Snow from Skies had many other tales of Old Wolf, with his red coat, the best of Gaia's children, noble, proud, wild, aiding wolf-born and wolf-changers in their time of need. But Center of Whispers missed his pack and his old life. He returned to his pack and was accepted. He let the Garu things he had learned slip away, except for the tales of Old Wolf of the Woods. Later, he made it with a wolf that he named Snowcrest. They laughed, played, and sang under the hunter's moon. She bore him five pups, two sons and three daughters. Center of Whispers played with his children, taught them to hunt, and how to survive. For seven years, he ran with Snowcrest and loved her better than his own heart. But he was still Garu and she Wolf. Age caught up with Snowcrest, so she laid down to pass into death. Center of Whispers stayed by her side until the end. After her bright eyes closed, he alone howled the song of mourning for her. Now, his wolf life was over. None of his children were Garu, but their pups might be. So he said farewell to them with songs and nudges, then returned to the Red Talons. The Red Talons were surprised at his return, for they had believed he had forsaken everything but the wolf. Center of Whispers replied that it was the visions of the old wolf of the woods that brought him back to them. They reckoned this strange, but still welcomed him back, and some even considered him wise. In three years, Center of Whispers rose to be third in their pack, but he never forgot about old wolf of the woods. There was something in his soul that called him to seek out the old wolf, and that the old wolf was also seeking him through time, through the Umbra. They were destined to meet in some appointed place. So Center of Whispers left the Red Talons once more to find the ancient grandfather. He called on the spirits to aid him in his search, followed the trails through the long grasses in the thick woods of the north. Finally, he found the place where Old Wolf of the Woods liked to roam. But how did Center of Whispers know that, he wondered. Then he heard the dogs howl and smelled men with their guns and their tobacco. Seven of the cousins, he thought, four of the apes. Center then shifted into Krino's form and attacked, killing one dog, then one hunter. The other dogs fell on him, ripping, tearing, and biting into his flesh. The hunters fired their rifles into him. Now a Garu is strong, but enough bullets and enough wounds can bring even the strongest down. As his vision blurred, Center of Whispers saw yellow eyes staring at him from the brush. Old Wolf of the Woods burst forth, fell on one hunter, and killed him instantly. Center of Whispers, his morale renewed, threw off the dogs and fought alongside the old wolf. Finally, the humans were dead and the dogs driven off. Center of Whispers shifted into lupus form and howled in victory. But Old Wolf of the Woods sat quietly among the bodies of the slain until Center finished. The old wolf of the woods said to the young, Come with me. And the two walked off into the deep wooded hills 
and then deeper into the umbra. There, Old Wolf of the Woods and Center of Whispers hunted the great buffalo among the ancient redwoods. The old wolf gave Center of Whispers his red coat and his great size so that other wolves might recognize him. As they rested, Old Wolf taught Center of Whispers ancient wisdom, skill, and great magic, and how the old wolf extended his life and chose his successor, how he had chosen Center of Whispers before he had even been born. Finally, Old Wolf of the Woods laid down one last time so that his long life could finally end. Apocalypse is coming soon, he said. Garu need aid. Wolves, your first pack. When Old Wolf died, Center of Whispers abandoned the name of his rite of passage. The only thing he kept of his past life was the memory of Snowcrest, her sparkling eyes and her white fur. Then, Center of Whispers was no more. Even now, in certain woods at night, wolves can feel his eyes upon them, the first of Gaia's children, protector of his kind and kin, the old wolf of the woods. And those were the top ten werewolves of the Red Talons. The Talons are, in general, a pretty appalling bunch, but in other ways the Red Talons are pitiable. Their views are myopic in the extreme. For them, killing humans is simply their Gaia-given right. And yet when humans kill them, whether in malice or defense, it is vile murder to be punished with as much slaughter as the Red Talons have energy for. They long for a world that they lack the power to restore. Well, at least not without destroying themselves entirely. But the Red Talons are a dying tribe too proud to change their ways, and too weak to force the world to be what they want. But the next tribe does not seek to change things with brute force alone. Instead, they utilize persuasion, manipulation, blackmail, subterfuge, and when needs be, assassination, to shape events to their benefit, and the benefit of the Garu Nation, of course. Coming up next, the top 10 werewolves of the Shadow Lords. <laughs>